that I know that's all in God's hands, and I know He'll He'll work out for His for His good and His glory. All right, I, I'm going to continue with. Uh, you remember in, in November I started in. Um, you know, I'm going to move this mat because it kind of goes up and down, and I like to stay where I am. All right. Um, uh, I started in uh, November talking about First Peter. I wanted to talk about First Peter because I felt that what you read in First Peter, the situation that Peter was facing, has some similarity to what we are facing today and what we've seen in the last few weeks. I'm even more convinced uh, that it's going to be more that way. I, I'm one of those that believe that Christians are slowly towards the end before Christ comes again are going to face uh, a lot of challenges and a lot of persecution. And uh, with the, some of the things, some of the uh, decisions that were made this week, like the removal of the 1776 uh, teaching in our schools, is clear evidence that we as Christians are in for a rough time. So I, I think this looking at the book of Peter is a, is a good thing for us to do uh, at this, this particular stage in, in our life and the history of our country. Now, to understand the book of Peter, you, you've got to understand something of the history. If you don't understand the history of the time and what was happening, it, it, may not, it may be a little difficult to understand what Peter was doing. Nero was now the Caesar. He, he was the leader in Rome, ruled the entire world. He came to be the Caesar when he was 18 years of age through his mother, who organized the killing of one of his relatives, and she really was the Caesar, but he was just the, sort of a spokesperson in a sense. At 22, he killed his mother, and now he's 28. And he, we understand from history, was caught up with drugs, and he was just a real unusual personality. But one of the things he was terrified about was death and darkness. And so he, in the city of Rome, he made these spires, tire spires, in the streets of Rome, and he would light them at night and around the palace and so on, so there was light because he was afraid of the darkness. Well, apparently, uh, the story is told that one of these spires fell over and fell against one of the houses in Rome. And you know, back in those days, and even if you've been to some of these parts, uh, the, the, in the Middle East, they still build homes this way. They build them out of straw and they cover them with mud. And, of course, they catch fire very easily. And you know, uh, history tells us 20 5% quarter of the city of Rome burned before they were able to control the fire. Well, Nero was terrified about what was going to happen because he was the person really that caused it because of these spires that he had. And so he had to come up with somebody to blame for the fire. And, you know, he, he blamed Christians. Now, he blamed Christians because the church in Rome was growing rapidly and they wouldn't surrender to the rule of the Roman Empire. They said, no, we, we're not going to make you first. Our God is first. And they were mostly Jews, and they didn't like Jews, and now they were Jewish Christians, and they didn't like them either. And so great persecution began among the church, initially in Rome, and it began to spread around the Roman Empire. They were arresting Christians. They were uh, crucifying them in, in Rome, uh, but putting them in, in, in the fire and burning them at the stake. They were sending them to fight the lions in the Colosseum. This was the situation that Christians faced when Peter began to write this letter. He wrote the letter about 66 AD, a couple of years after the fire. And he was writing to Christians to say, look, I know what's happening and I know what you're doing. You're questioning whether you made the right decision to become Christians and you want to flee the faith and deny that you're Christians, deny that you're even Jewish because you don't want to have to face the persecution. But I want to tell you, don't do that. You know, if what has been shared with you, if what you've committed your life to is the truth, you don't want to forsake the truth because it will endanger your internal security. And so he writes this book of First Peter, and he's writing to Christians saying, look, no matter what the persecution is, no matter what the challenges you're facing, no matter the criticism that you have, what is important is the truth. And you know, as John, as Jesus shared, in John 8, 42, you need to know the truth because only the truth can what? Set you free. And so Peter writes this book, this extraordinary book. Now naturally you would see as he's writing this because he's referring to the Old Testament. Of course at this time he didn't have the New Testament, but he's writing mostly to Jews. He keeps referring to the Old Testament and what has happened in history that they have seen in the Old Testament. And he said, you trusted that, didn't you? 
You believed that, didn't you? Well, this is what I'm telling you. Uh, these prophets that wrote the Old Testament were even forecasting what's happening now. That's what he's telling them in the book of Peter. And it's the same for you and me today. The most persecuted people in the world are Christians. There are more Christians every year that die for their faith than any other group on this planet. Now, why do you think that is? Well, you know why it is, because Satan uh, is the enemy. And he's going to do everything he can to, to, to destroy not only Christianity and, and the teaching of the Bible, but to, to, to destroy the evidence of God. So these things are not unusual to us. We're not surprised by these things happening. So Peter's writing, and we're going to look today in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 9 through 12, and I, I give the title of this, this saying, and I took it from some of these banners you see on these billboards, and, and what I'm saying is that God is saying, I'm always thinking about you and I love you, God. Because I want to assure you, as I want to assure myself, no matter what the days are going to be before us, Listen, God is thinking about us. God's got a plan for us. And he loves us. And we can trust him. And things may happen that we don't understand and we cannot explain, but this, is, this hasn't been any dissimilar from history. And here in this passage we're looking at this morning, there are three major issues that Peter is talking about, and they're very, very important. And I hope that we can see them and understand. The first thing he talks about is the message of the gospel. And begins here in verse 9, and he's beginning to share here about the inheritance that Christians have when they come to know Christ as their own personal Savior. And he begins by saying, look at verse 9, and he says, you have already obtained as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Now what he's talking about here, he, he, he's talking here about salvation. He's saying, listen, when you were born and you passed through life, there's coming a time and you're going to come to the end of your life. Where are you going to go? And he says, the only book that I know, the only truth that I know, the only assurance that I know is that in the Bible, the God of the Bible, the creator of this world, the creator of the entire universe, assures us about salvation, that he will save our souls. That's what Peter is saying. And he goes on to prove it from looking at the, the Old Testament. And he, he's telling them, you, you know what happened in Isaiah chapter 14. You know how it was that there, there was an angel, a cherubim, the head of all the angels, his name was Lucifer. And he came to the point of saying to himself, I know what God does, I've seen what God does. In fact, I think I could do it myself. And God said, oh, you can't because you're a created being. You can only operate within the limits of the creator, what the creator has given to you. But you know, as I know, that Satan said, well, I'm going to do my own thing. And that's what sin is. I say to people all the time that I counsel, sin is doing your own thing, not doing God's thing, not doing what the Bible teaches, doing your own thing. Now, you might be, not, you might be doing your own thing not to be naughty or nasty or evil or sinful, but it is sin. Because the Bible said anything that you do in disobedience to God, anything that you do is outside of the counsel of the word of God is sin. Even if you didn't plan it to be sin, it is sin. And Lucifer said, well, I'm going to do my own thing. I, I, I think I can be, what did he say? A God. Not God. He knew he couldn't. But he would be a God. And you will find that many of the religions in the world today, what do they say? Well, we can talk to you about a God. Uh, we can tell you how, like the Mormons so tell you, you can't even become a god. <laughs> because they know they cannot reproduce, they cannot replace the god. And so Peter writes here and he says, you, you know, you already having obtained the outcome of your faith, you've received the salvation of your souls. He's talking about salvation. From the moment of creation and uh, from the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, there began a, a, a process of redemption. That, that's what theologians call this act of God to redeem those who, who've been lost because of sin, who are going to a lost eternity because of sin. So Peter begins to write here about salvation, talking about salvation. And he's saying, what do you think the main essence of the Bible is? Now, the Bible does talk about history. The Bible does talk about archaeology. The Bible does talk about law and science and a lot of other things, medicine. 
And where it talks about it, it's telling the truth and it's an authority. But the main reason the Bible is written is to tell you and me about salvation. Because that's what God is concerned about. He doesn't care whether you're a president or you uh, clean toilets. He, He doesn't care what your role is in this world. What he's concerned about is the condition of your soul. And he wants you and me to understand that we can have the security of our soul for eternity because we're going to come to an end one day. We're going to go to one of two places, heaven or hell. God wants us to go to heaven. So he talks to us about the security of our soul. And this is what Peter is emphasizing here. The Bible is a book about salvation. So he writes to these people. He said, you know what the Old Testament writers, the prophets talked about? They talked about salvation. Now, regardless of what's going to happen now, because of what the Romans are doing, I want you to keep the focus where the focus needs to be, on salvation. But he also mentions here how you obtain salvation, the obtaining of the outcome of your faith. How do you receive salvation? Well, you receive it by faith. There are many religions in this world. There are numbers. I don't know how many there are, but there are numbers of religions in this world. And they're, they're... discovered or they're developed by human reasoning. The Bible is not like that. The Bible didn't come about because of human reasoning or some academic ability or some great intelligence. The Bible came about, as we're going to see, as he continues later on to explain to us, by divine revelation, and by, by divine illumination in the minds of those who recorded these truths from God. Yeah, there are many religions in the world. But there's an interesting difference between the religions of the world and Christianity. You know what it is? Very simple, really. If you study the religions of the world, you will find that if you want to get to Nevada, if you want to get to their heaven, it's going to take works. You're going to have to work. There's certain laws you're going to have to fulfill. And if you don't fulfill the laws and you don't do the right work, you will not make it to heaven. Christianity is not like that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, We are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. You didn't do it. It was a free gift. It was not of works. Lest any man would boast and say, I got to heaven because I worked hard. So Peter writes and he says, you know what the Old Testament prophets and writers wrote to us and told us? We can have the security of our souls. We can have eternal security. You don't have to be afraid of where you're going to go, what's going to happen to you when you die. And how do we know that? By faith. I love the acrostic of faith. You know, F-A-I-T-H forsaking all I trust him. That's what it's about. It doesn't mean to say that I understand everything about this world. And neither did the prophets. Neither did the writers of the Bible. They wrote about the past. They wrote about the present. They wrote about the future, but they didn't understand it all. But they trusted it by faith. And look how he says it here. It's not only salvation by faith, but it's for sure. He doesn't say, look, I'm not really confident about this, but I'm thinking that it might. No, it's not like that at all. He says, you, having obtained the outcome of your faith for the salvation of your souls. This This is not a suggestion. This is a statement of fact. So as Peter is writing, he's writing to these people who are facing persecution. They're beginning to ask themselves, did I make the right decision when I became a Christian? And he's saying, my friend, let me tell you about the emphasis of the Bible. Let me tell you the Bible is a message of the gospel. It's the message of good news. It's the account of salvation. But then he goes on about the second issue. Look at verse 10. He talks here about the mystery of the gospel. He says, yeah, I know, I know when people ask you about the Bible, they ask you about what you believe. It is kind of mysterious. Do you think you're the first person as a Christian that felt that way? Well, look what he says in verse 10. He says, listen, didn't you see what the prophets pursued themselves? It was a mystery to them, these who wrote it. Look at verse 10. As to this salvation that I'm talking to you about, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come, talking about what they're experiencing then, that would come to you, they made careful search and inquiry. Now, how was it that these people, these prophets, these writers, how was it that they wrote these things? We know they're accurate. The things they wrote about creation, about the past, about the present, they even wrote things about the future. Amazing things. You get people like Isaiah and Jeremiah that even give the name of Cyrus, who didn't appear on the scene of history until 100 years after they'd written it. How could they get a name like that unless it was 
divinely revealed to them. And this is what the Bible tells us, that these men and women who, who wrote down the Bible, we will find that these people who wrote these, like he mentions here, were people who wrote by divine revelation. Now, divine revelation means God used the character of the person. He used the intelligence, of the, the personality, of the, the training, the education of the person. But he led them by the Holy Spirit to write these things that were not common knowledge and they could have never known except they were mysteriously revealed to them. I mean, you find Daniel. Daniel wrote things about, uh, about leaders that were going to come in the world after Assyria. It was going to come Babylon. After Babylon was going to come Persia. After Persia was going to come Greece. After Greece was going to become Rome. And then he says, and then there's going to be a long time before there comes another great event, the rapture. Now, how did Daniel know these things? How could he know these extraordinary things? Couldn't have got it by just being intelligent by common knowledge or wisdom, no. He got it by revelation. That's obvious. These things were revealed to him. Now, I know some of these other religions say, well, these things were revealed to me. Yeah, but when you test them against history, you test them against the facts, they don't stand up. But the Bible does. But not only does he say here about, look at verse 10 again, not only does he talk about divine revelation, but divine inspiration. You know, these authors, when they, they wrote, they, they, there is something human about it because it was written by humans, but something unusually divine. And Peter writing to these Christians saying, look, uh, don't you see here? Look how these prophets, they made careful search and inquiry. They were saying to themselves, wow, what is this that God is revealing to me? They made careful search of these things and they inquired about these things because they were a mystery to them. When I, and I, I do it all the time and love to do it, talk to people, I, I did it at least three people this week, I shared the gospel with them, prayed with them. But when one of the fellows I was talking, he said, how do you know that you believe this stuff? How do you know? And I didn't tell him it was a mystery, but it is a mystery. There are things about it that are so extraordinary that the human intelligence cannot explain them other than they have been proved by historical fact. This is, this is part of the wonder of being a Christian, the excitement, the thrill of being a Christian. But he goes on, Peter goes on, talks about not only what the prophets um, pursued, but look what he says about what the prophets proclaimed. Look again at verse 10. And as for this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come, come to you, made careful search and inquiry. What he's saying is, listen, this, this that I'm teaching you goes right back to the very beginning. And Peter is saying, look, look at how these prophets and these writers wrote down the Old Testament. They wrote things that you would never discover right from the very beginning. They tell you about creation. Look at history and look at the different people that God has used through history and it's all been a matter of grace. And he's writing them. He said, you know what? What a gracious God we have. I mean, you think about Adam and Eve. He could have wiped them out after they sinned, but he didn't. What about Noah? He was the only righteous man on earth, and he provided for him. He protected them with Noah's ark. What an extraordinary... What about Abraham? He was a man in Babylon, a satanic city, but the Bible tells you he was a seeker of the truth. God, by his grace, led him. And, and Peter, of course, he doesn't do this, but he could go on through the Bible and say, look how many people we can find. Uh, in the Bible like this. Look at Moses. <laughs> Look at God, how gracious God was to Moses, raising him up and getting him out and getting all those people out of Egypt. And look at all of, of the family of, of Abraham. And how God's grace has been exercised through the Old Testament. And Peter is saying, do you not think that God, by his grace, is going to be gracious to you who believe in him, have trusted him, have committed their lives to him? In faith, of course he will. That's what he's always done in the past. Why would he do something different in the future? So Peter is writing to cause these people to look at the word of God and see the testimony of God's word. And he talks about what the prophets pursued, what the prophets proclaimed, but also what the prophets pondered over. Look at, look at verse 11. And there are two major things he talks about here that are very important. Look at verse 11. He said, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them 
was indicating. He said, listen, God has a timetable for the things that he does. Obviously he does. And the prophets knew that what they're writing was under the revelation, the inspiration of the Spirit of God. They call it the Spirit of Christ, but of course Christ was on the throne. It was the Spirit of God that was leading them. Time. And he's writing them and saying, you know, God uses time in a very unique way and he has certain things that he does in different dimensions of time. And he doesn't, uh, of course, do the same thing uh, always, but uh, that's how God works. And he said, you know, some of these Old Testament prophets were, were pondering how was it God used time. And it's interesting, you know, in the Greek, there are two words for time. One is keros and the other one is chronos. Kiros means, you know, a length of time, a dispensation. Kronos means this minute or this hour. You know, it's more specific. Well, the word here is the word chronos. And Peter is saying, listen, you understand that, that God was working over a long period of time. And over that period of time, he, he was working what we call it. Uh, he was working by the principle of, of grace. But not only that, we, we, we realize that in the past, even and the writers were writing about this, in the past God had always spoken through the nation of Israel, the Jewish nation. But now he's coming to another time, another chronos, when, when he, he's going to have a different, in a different dispensation, do something a little different, but still God, God is still in charge and still in control. And so Peter writes them, he said, you know, that's how God works. He's in control of time. And he has plans throughout history. And only he knows what those plans are and how those plans work. But he goes on further to say, not only is time important, but the truth is important. Look at the last part of verse 11. Seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within one was indicating, as he predicted the suffering of Christ and the glories to follow. Ah, now these guys are starting to say, now this is really getting confusing. Here we have these prophets and Peter is writing them and saying, yeah, they they pursued the truth. Not only that, they they proclaimed the truth, but they pondered over what was happening. Because here, look, look again at what it says here, indicating he predicted the suffering of Christ and the glories to follow. Well, you know, the Jews said the Messiah is going to come. We have no doubt the Messiah is going to come and he's going to raise up the Jewish nation and we're going to rule over the world and we're going to be recognized as being right all along. But then they're roughing and say, but when the Messiah comes, he's going to suffer? Oh, no, they said, we, we, don't, we, we don't understand how that could be. And here we find that they were pondering what that really meant. Well, it's interesting, and you know this too, that when Jesus came and he was crucified, he he was walking to Emmaus. You remember that account? Uh, In Luke uh, chapter 24, he was walking to Emmaus, and there were two men who joined him on the road. And as they were walking along with them, he he said to them in in, um, Luke chapter 22, talking to these men, uh, he said this, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken and written to you. Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things and then to enter into his glory? You see, the Jews believed that Messiah would come and, and he would rule and they would be lifted up to be the leaders along with him in that ruling. Jesus said, no, that's not how it works. Even the prophets wrote, and, and they pondered, they couldn't quite understand it, but uh, but. But the Messiah, when he was coming, he's going to come as a suffering servant. And later, he's going to come to rule and to reign. Now, you know that and I know that, but he's saying, listen, there were those in the Old Testament didn't understand that. There were those who pondered these things. How could that be? How could the Messiah do that? That he would come first to suffer? that he might save those who by faith put their faith in him? Yes. And then later he would come back again to be the sovereign ruler of the entire universe. Well then, 
the third issue that Peter talks about here, he, as he continues on in verse 12, he talks about the majesty of the gospel. He writes to these people who are struggling, who, who are questioning their faith. He says, listen, think about the message of the gospel, how reliable it has been, how the writers have told us about things in the past and the present and the future, how extraordinary it is. Why would you not trust it now? And then he writes them further and he talks about the mystery. Of the God. Yeah, there are some things that are hard for us to understand. They're not according to the plan that we would plan. In fact, even about the Messiah. Well, they didn't realize he was coming to be a suffering servant before he became the sovereign leader of the universe. But that's what the prophets taught. And that's what they wrote. And even they didn't understand it at the time. And then he says, but what about the, just the sheer majesty, the extraordinary nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the amazing nature of the Bible? And it ceases not to amaze me. Uh, and I, I trust that that is your experience as well. And he writes here in verse 12, he says, look, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves. But in fact, when they were writing these things down, they were writing to you, the church of the first century. And really, the church today in this uh, 2021, uh, uh, 2,000 years later, still the same thing. But he, he writes here, and he, he writes, look at the, the first part of verse 12. He talks here about the disappointment of the prophets. Look what he says. It was real to them that they were not serving themselves, they're not writing to themselves, but to you in these things that now have been announced to you. Now, this is very interesting. He said they were writing about an age of grace. They didn't understand it. They couldn't understand how God would give equal protection to Gentiles and Jews. Well, they understood he would to Jews, but to Gentiles and Jews? They didn't understand that. We praise God that we live in that age. And what about Abraham? Abraham lived in Babylon. God said, I'm going to take you out. I'm going to give you your own land. And he's there in the land uh, and... After he'd been there for some time, he says to God, God, when are you going to give me this land? Oh, I'm going to give it to the nation of Israel. But it didn't happen during Abraham's lifetime. But it did happen. But it didn't happen during Abraham's lifetime. Abraham was saying, well, I thought it was going to happen during my lifetime. What about Daniel when he was taken into captivity? God had revealed to him he was going to bring the people out of captivity and back to the promised land. And Daniel is there and he's telling the people, God's going to get us out of here. He's going to take us back from Babylon. We're going back to the promised land. We're going back to Israel. Then he gets a letter from Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, God has revealed to me that you're going to be in captivity for 70 years. Oh, yeah. Daniel says, well, wait a minute. They took me away in 606 B.C. That means 536 B.C. I'm going to be dead before this happens. Yeah, you're right. What about Joel? When you read in the book of Joel, Joel said God is not just going to put his spirit on us like we read about in Jeremiah, but he's going to indwell us. What a great time that's going to be, that we are actually going to be filled with the spirit of God. Didn't happen during Joel's lifetime. Didn't happen until the day of a Pentecost. And so there was some times, Peter writes, he says, you know, there's some things that these writers, they didn't understand. Some of these Old Testament godly men in the Old Testament trusted God, expected God to do that. And God did do it, but he didn't do it in their lifetime. So Peter's writing to these Christians and saying, look, are you going to trust the book? Are you going to trust the creator and the writer of the book, God himself? Or are you going to let the things of this world disillusion you and you're going to fall away from the faith? You know and I know. People are doing that. Peter writes to them and <laughs> encourages them not to do that, but take faith in the strength of the Word of God. And then look at the middle of verse 12. He talks about the, the development of the church. He says, it was revealed to them, these writers of the Old Testament, that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things, which now have been announced to you. How? Through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit that were sent from heaven. You know, the day of Pentecost brought in a, 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 a great new event. Up until Pentecost, yes, the nation of Israel had been the custodians of God's word and of God's teaching. But at Pentecost, 
that all changed. And God began a new entity, the church, made up of Jews and Gentiles. And it's to this group that he's entrusted the message of the gospel. And it's going to continue that way through this, what we call it the age of grace, but really all the way through the church age, which ends, the church age ends at the battle of Armageddon. And then who is it that's going to step into the millennium? Mostly Jews. There will be some Gentiles, but it must be Jews. And Christ will come to reign. And the nation of Israel will be lifted up again. God isn't failing the nation of Israel. He isn't failing to keep the, the truth that he's taught in his word. But now it is for the church the responsibility of sharing the gospel, of telling the truth uh, until Christ comes again. Then he adds with this extraordinary, I love this last little comment that he adds here, and it's really an extraordinary comment. And he said, you know, these things into which even angels long to look. He said, you know, even angels. And you remember what happened with Lucifer when he, when he defied God? He convinced a third of the angels in heaven to go with him. We know in Revelation chapter 12, it, it explains that to us, and they were thrown out of heaven. But two-thirds stayed. And they, angels are servants of God. They, they don't know the future. They don't have the ability to know what's going to happen tomorrow. They don't get that information. They have to wait like you and me to see what's going to happen. And angels, we know angels are, are set up just like God is and just like you and I are. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's a trinity. And you have a, a, a spirit in which the Holy Spirit can dwell and a soul that's going to be eternal and a body. We're, we're, we're a triune being and so are angels. There are cherubim and seraphim and common angels. Angels are servants of God and they, they ha have been invited to do extraordinary things but they don't know the future any more than you and me. And yet they've been given some... Great responsibility. Who was it that guarded the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were shut out? Oh, it was angels. <laughs> who, who was it that, that came to, to Noah and explained to him about developing the ark and took care of things? Who was it that closed the door on the ark? Well, well it was saying there's so many things that they were involved. They visited Abraham. They visited Lot and Hagar. You remember Jacob's ladder, where angels ascended. Now, you would think they would descend first. No, no. That, that speaks to us about the mystery of God. They ascended and descended. And they were there at that time. And they were there to stop Balaam and moved his ass. And, you know, so many of these things angels were involved in. They were involved in the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist, the, the announcement of the birth of Christ. Uh, they were there, you know, when, when Jesus was tempted. That You read in Matthew chapter 4. They were there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Angels. And, and yet we read here, he says, you know, these things, angels long to understand and long to look into, but even angels didn't have insight. But God, through his word, has given us extraordinary insight into what he is doing. As I thought about that, um, I, re I recalled a, a story, that I, a true story that I've heard about a, a young uh, Baptist preacher in Houston, Texas. His name is Craig Barnes. Craig Barnes grew up in a family where his father was a devoted Christian, had devotions with the family. It was he and his brother. He never missed going to church on Wednesday night or Sunday. He went to Bible studies. He had a quiet time, and he was just a great father. Then one day when... Craig and his brother Joseph came home. His dad came home from work. He had a letter. He handed it to his mother. And he said, I'm leaving. I'm never coming back. I, I, I don't want to be a husband. I don't want to be a father. I don't want to be a spiritual leader anymore. I don't think I have the ability to do it. So I'm leaving you everything, but I'm leaving. I'm not coming back. And he left. Craig said they, they were astounded. They were astonished. They couldn't understand it because his father was such a godly man and had given such godly leadership. And so after a year or two, he didn't come back. They started hunting for him, started looking to where he'd gone. Well, he, he fled uh, from Texas and he, he first went to California. Then he went to Montana. And then he went to Illinois. And then he went to Pennsylvania. Eventually, they lost contact with him. Craig said it, it was so sad because 
my brother and I, we, we never had dad there for when we graduated from high school. We went on to college. He wasn't there at college graduation. We got married. He wasn't there at our wedding. I even went to seminary and so did my brother. We both got a PhD at seminary. We were both in the ministry. We were both Southern Baptist preachers. My dad was never there. He said, the thing that I longed for more than anything else was one Sunday I'd be preaching and a man would come down the aisle and say, son, I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad. It's so great to hear you preach, but it's never happened. He said, one day I got a phone call from a preacher in Florida. And the preacher said, uh, are you Craig Barnes? He said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, well, I, I want to tell you, Father just passed away. He's been a member of my church here in Florida. And he had given me a letter and said, when he passed away, I was to open this letter. Said, and it said, your name and the name of your brother, and I was to advise you that he passed away. So Craig and his brother got a plane, and they flew to, to Florida to go to the funeral. They went to the funeral. He said, I stood there and looked at the casket, and I said, why? This is so extraordinary that this would happen and my dad seemed to be such a godly guy I don't know why this had happened and I longed to talk with him I longed to tell him everything that I've done but I never had an opportunity after the funeral the the preacher said look I could take you to his house he lives in a little shabby trailer but if you want to go there I could take you there so we took him and they walked in the trailer and it was very shabby and not very well taken care of, and there was a kitchen table. On the kitchen table, there was a stack of books and there was a Bible. He looked at the books and he opened the books and they were daily devotions that he'd been studying and he'd been writing down what he, and he had the dates for years and years, every day, writing down what he'd discovered. It was a log of everything that he learned from the Bible. And then beside, the, on the other side of the Bible, there was a book called My Prayer List. And so Craig said, I opened up that book and had a list of people that he prayed for every day. He said, who do you think was the first two names that were there on the prayer list? It was me and my brother Joseph. And this is what Craig said about that event. The grace was not that I received what I wanted. I didn't want to find my father. I did want to find my father in time. The grace was that Jesus never lost him, that we as a family did. And for me, the grace was that what I realized, that through all of those years that I'd been praying for my dad, praying that he would not walk away from the Lord, he never did. I was speaking with the Heavenly Father who told me, I'll never leave you, never forsake you, nor your father either. You know, there are some things in this world we don't understand. There are some things we will never understand. There were prayers that we pray and we pray fervently and persistently that are not answered. And you and I may wonder why. And I do. But I'll tell you one thing, it'll never cause me to stop believing in the gospel, the message of the gospel. It'll never shake me and cause me to question the mystery of the gospel. It will never cause me to think any other than this is the most majestic message in all the world. I want to tell you, we are going to face, I believe, some challenging times. And I want to encourage you, be faithful. Keep the faith. God is going to keep his word. Jesus is going to come back. I think in my lifetime, I may be wrong. I've been wrong a lot of times. But I believe it will be even in my lifetime. What I see happening in the world around us today convinces me. Uh, you know, I don't want to go into with us now, but you know the Bible said that the last nation that will rise as a major nation to shake the world is the silos. Now in Hebrew, that is the Chinese. Who is it that has come from nowhere? and is raising up to be the most powerful nation in the world. I think we're living in very unusual, exciting times. And I want to encourage you as I encourage myself, stay in the Word. Trust the Word. Jesus is coming, and I want to stand with the millions on that crystal sea, that crystal lake, and give Him glory and praise. Let's pray. 
Father, we do thank you so much for this uh, letter of Peter. And we know that when Peter was writing it, he was facing a great amount of uh, challenge and persecution. In fact, uh, just a couple of years after he wrote this letter, he was crucified upside down because he didn't feel he was worthy to be crucified like his Savior. Father, I pray you would speak to us in these days, challenge us in these days to understand the wonder of what it is we hold in our hand, the Word of God. And help us, Father, until we see you face to face, that we will be faithful to you until you call us home. Pray this in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake alone. Amen. I want to say, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as Savior, if you're here this morning, you have questions that you want to ask me, uh, I do stay around and I will stay around as long as I need to to answer any questions you have. But most of all, if you want to know about how you can know for sure that Christ is the Lord of your life. I'd be delighted to tell you that. If you want to know more about this church or being a member of this church, if you've never been baptized, it's important for you to identify yourself with the ministry, the members of the body of Christ, baptism. Then you, you take the time and you come draw me aside. I'd love to chat to you about those things. Let's stand together now as Rick leads us in our hymn.